Welcome to the day we call Palm Sunday. But this is a little different than it's ever been for any of us. It's probably the first time you've sat at home to be at church at Trinity Presbyterian. It's the first time I've preached just to a camera on a windy day with rain threatened, but we're together. Trinity's gone high tech. For the first time, they can put a service online so you can watch it. And when they asked me to do Palm Sunday and Easter, I was honored and thrilled. During my preparation, I asked myself a question, when's the last time you preached a Palm Sunday sermon or an Easter sermon? The last Palm Sunday sermon was March 28, 1999. And the last Easter service was April 4th, 1999. And it was with you. So what an honor, I guess every 21 years, I'll come and do a Palm Sunday and Easter service. I've been the Minister of Pastoral Care during this interim beginning in September. I have a lot of people I've been visiting several times. Now I make phone calls. But I want you to know if you'd like a phone call, please call the church office and let them know if you need some help. And I need help sometimes. If you need some help, please feel free to call. I'd be glad to be someone to talk to. And then finally this. At the beginning of last week, I began a discipline of prayer that is feeling just right. I put the church directory in the place where I pray, and each morning I pray for three households. I pray for you. And at some point, I'll work my way through the directory and I'll start again. But for me, it's a way to feel like we are connected. You might want to consider the same thing. Let our worship begin. Let us join together in our call to worship. Hosanna to the one who comes in God's name. Shout your blessings, sing your praises. Blessed be the one who enters in the name of God. In Christ we are free to be fully human, to celebrate and use our gifts to God's glory. Give thanks to God who has richly blessed us. Praise God whose manifest love endures forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, a quiet hymn sings, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord. Lord, we wish we were together in this sanctuary. We need each other, but we are together in the spirit and in you. Trees stand alone, it seems, but beneath the ground, their roots intermingle. And as we look up, their branches soon blossoms and leaves intermingle too. So even as we are physically separate, we are rooted and grounded in you and lift our arms in praise to you. Amen. And now let us rejoice in song with the singing of our gathering hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. <laughs>
Remember with me an afternoon when Jesus was preaching in the marketplace. And suddenly he was interrupted by a cadre of Pharisees dragging a woman who they'd caught in the act of adultery. And they threw her at his feet. And all they needed from him was consent as a rabbi to proceed to stone her to death. Jesus does something we can't particularly interpret. He bends over and writes in the dust with his finger. I like to think he was asking his father how to handle a tough situation. He stood up and he looked at the crowd and he said, you without sin cast the first stone. And beginning with the oldest of them to the youngest, one by one they dropped their stones and walked away. None of us are without sin, so it's good to make confession. Join me in the prayer of confession. Wonderful God, forgive us that as Jesus journeys toward a cross, we prefer parades and palms and noisy celebrations. Forgive us that we turn away from Golgotha with its rusted nails and twisted thorns. Forgive us that we resist the challenging walk through these days ahead. Forgive us for spiritualizing the pointed political, economic, and social message of the man on the donkey. For us to welcome Jesus for who he is, not who we wish him to be. Let us confess for a moment in silence. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. For God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture is from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, the prophet who predicted the future Messiah. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Lord says, I will remove the war chariots from Israel and take the horses from Jerusalem. And bows used in battle will be destroyed. Your king will make peace among the nations. He will rule from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the world. Thank God for this blessing of Holy Scripture.
Listen for the word of God from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. After Jesus said this, he went on in front of them toward Jerusalem. As he came near Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and as you go in, you'll find a colt tied up that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you why you're untying it, tell them quite exactly this. The master needs it. They went on the way and found everything just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying it? The master needs it, they answered, and they took the colt to Jesus. Then they threw their cloaks over the animal and helped Jesus get on. As he rode on, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near Jerusalem, at the place where the road went down the Mount of Olives, the large crowd began to thank God and praise him in loud voices for all the things they had seen. They said, God bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. As Jesus came closer to the city and saw it, he wept over it, saying, if only today you knew what was needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround you with barricades and blockade you and close you in from every side. They will complete you, completely destroy you and the people. Not a single stone will be left in place because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. You who know me know how I'm going to begin. The Bible says that no word of truth can be written or spoken unless the Spirit guided. No word of truth can be taken to heart and mind and life and illuminate, perhaps be transformational, unless the Spirit guided. I know you're two days later than my standing here, but prayers don't get trapped in time and space. So I want you to pray for me, that I may be open channel for a word from the Lord. And pray for yourself, that your heart and mind and life will be available for chance for illumination, perhaps transformation. Let us pray, quietly. I've been uh, doing a lot of reading lately. Maybe you have too. I have a stack of novels by favorite authors. I started one about two nights ago, and last night it happened. What do you mean, Howard? What's the it that happened? When you first start with a novel, you kind of have a bird's eye view of it, arm's length. You're trying to get to know the names of the characters, You're trying to create the scenery of the book in your mind. You're getting some early feel for plot development. But then I find it's generally around page 50 or 60. All of a sudden, I get pulled down into the story. I'm no longer reading from a distance, but I can hear the speaking of the characters. I can feel the energy of the shifts of moods. I can feel the tensions of the plot lines forming. That's what the Bible wants to do. Not just read it or hear it from a distance, but get pulled down into it. Be present to it. Be part of it. Let me make a suggestion of how you might do that. I'd like you to decide to be one of these three disciples, Peter, James, or John. Decide, Peter, James, or John. And let yourself, much as you can, as you know them from scripture, take on their identity. Let me help you. Why not remember back to the first time you met him? You were together the three of you down by the seaside cleaning your nets. 
and you noticed a stranger approaching. And even as he walked, there was something about him, the way he walked, the way he carried himself, a kind of a sense of authority. Then he began to speak to you, to teach. And there was something not only about his words, but the tone of his voice and the look on his face. They were captivating. But then you were startled to hear him ask you to follow him and become a disciple. But even more startled when you heard yourself say, yes, you left the nets and you joined the disciple circle. Or remember when you were up in the north, Jesus wanted to, as much as he could, stay away from the powers, the, the Jewish powers and the Roman powers in the city because they might be upset at what he was saying and they might seek retaliation. So he'd gone from village to village and town to town, mostly up in Galilee, but you'd been to the northernmost place you'd ever been, and Jesus invited you to go further north where you could be away from the crowds, no one would recognize you, kind of R and R. Remember sitting on the grass, chatting amongst each other, and Jesus raised his hand and said, I want to ask you something. What are people saying about me? What are the rumors out in the marketplace? They said, well, some think you're a prophet return, John the Baptist, they offered other things they'd heard. Jesus put up his hand again. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, I don't think you thought about it. It just immediately burst out of your mouth. You, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed the truth and wisdom of what you said, though it had to be guided by God. For the first time, you knew something of who he is, not just an amazing human being, but could it be the Son of God? Very shortly thereafter, maybe in the same setting, he began to talk about what the end of the story was going to be. That he was going to go to the city, and he was going to be in, in captured by the leadership of the time, and he was going to be executed. You didn't quite know what that meant then, you didn't like it, but you moved on. One more visit with Jesus. Remember when he brought you three, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountainside? And up on the mountainside, he um, suddenly just glowed with light. It was simply light. It's hard to explain it, but it was overwhelming. Then you came down from the mountain, and he again said, I'm going to go back to the city and be challenged and opposed and cast into the hands of evil men and executed. Remember that something shifted that day. You've been used to wandering east and west, north and a bit south to these towns and villages, but now it's like he set his face with clarity and determination. Now we're going to the city. No, it didn't happen right away. He walked through villages and towns where he preached and healed. He told a story to one crowd, the Good Samaritan. At first, weren't you offended by it, that Jesus would make a Samaritan, a hated Samaritan, a hero of a story, when a priest and Levite walked on the other side? A week or so later, you were in another town, and a crippled woman came up and Jesus healed her, but it was on the Sabbath, and you could see the looks on the faces of the Pharisees. They were not happy. Remember one afternoon, still days later, a rich man came to Jesus. Wasn't he dressed with incredible finery? But he asked the right question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him of the law, living faithful, and he said, I've, I've been doing that. Then Jesus said, there is something that keeps you from taking the next step. You don't own your possessions. Your possessions own you. Unless you 
give it all away, you cannot receive answer to the question you brought. And I remember the pathos of that man walking away. I remember Jesus looking with such obvious compassion on him. I remember the stories he told still days later about the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. And you felt inside what a joy it was having been lost to have been found. Or just a few days ago, coming through Jericho, Bartimaeus screamed out over the din of the crowd, and Jesus called him forward and healed his blindness. He looked up on a tree, and there was Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Zacchaeus came down from the tree. I want to have lunch at your house. But now we can move into real time. I'm going to become a disciple too. I picked Andrew. We arrived late afternoon to Mary Martha and Lazarus' house and managed to all sleep in the stable. This morning, Martha, hopefully with some help from Mary, made breakfast for all of us. We were not unfamiliar with the terrain. We knew which direction Jerusalem was, up that gentle hillside, past the village of Bethpage, to the crest of the hill, and then looking down on the magnificent valley, the Mount of Olives, the Tomb of David, through the Kidron Valley, and then up to the magnificent golden gate of the city. But notice, Jesus is beckoning for us to follow him. We are uncertain, we're confused, we're anxious, but we follow. We come to Bethpage, and there are the two disciples. He sent ahead with the donkey. No, the foal of the donkey, the colt of the donkey. To watch, they're, they're putting their cloaks on the donkey's back and helping mount the, the foal. It's, it's barely able to hold a grown man's weight. Jesus has to hold up his legs so his sandals and feet don't drag in the, in the grass. But look. Where have they all come from? All of a sudden, dozens and dozens and dozens of people are coming from every direction. They've caught something. They've understood something. They're putting their cloaks on the road. They're taking branches from trees and putting those on the road. They're remembering what Jesus wanted them to remember, the prophecy of Zechariah. Your king will come in humility and peacefulness. This is exactly what Jesus had in mind in riding this donkey up the hillside. Let's, let's walk ahead up to the crest of the hill because there seems to be some tumult, sound of tumult coming from there. And here we are at the edge. And look, there, there must be tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 people. They too are screaming welcome to the Messiah. But wait a minute. They're shouting, Son of David. Son of David doesn't mean a, a meek and quiet and humble Messiah riding on a donkey's foal. It means a general, a leader on a horse that will call us to arms to defeat the Romans. They're putting their arms in the air and saying, Hosanna, which is not rejoicing. It's, it's time for the revolution. Couldn't have worked. They all gathered for the Passover, way outnumbered the troops of the Romans. And they had weapons such as they were, ready to go. It's debatable whether they could have successfully overthrown the Romans. But that's not what Jesus is about. He comes humbly and peacefully. As I said, this is the first time I've prepared a Palm Sunday sermon since back in 1999. And I remembered things I knew from before, but something struck me. Let's see if it works. Jesus had a vision for a new world, a world of the beloved community, where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever falling stream, where you do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. As he said in his very first sermon in the 
in the synagogue where he almost got executed on day one. Good news for the poor. Releases the captives. Healing of the blind. Or in his last parable before this day, Matthew 25, where he said, when you do it to the least of these my brothers, feed them, tend to them, take them in, visit them, you do it unto me. And I want to suggest the two crowds on either side of the crest of that hill represent different visions of the future. Let's make it present. We all want this to be over. But what kind of world do we want to emerge out of the end of the pandemic? The people on the far side of the hill know exactly what they want. And what a lot of people are saying, let's get things back to where they were, where I have a full stock portfolio, where my bank account is full, I have my job back, I have my house, things just as they were, for whom that's not good news for too many people. But he has had that different vision of the beloved community, of justice and mercy and righteousness. A book that's made the most impression on me in the past year has this title as a place to end. The world, the more beautiful world, our hearts know is possible. The more beautiful world, our hearts know is possible. Jesus has in mind a more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. And that's what it means to say yes to him. So be it. Let us join in voice together as we share the affirmation of faith. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and earth, and every tongue confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we welcome Jesus' words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Gracious God, thank you for that invitation. We need it. Ever-present God, we're in a place we've never been in before. It's hard to get our bearings. We feel lost and confused. We're in our homes and apartments, our place in a senior living site, in a nursing home bed, wherever we are, we are struggling. So many feelings rise and fall. We are anxious and frightened. We are isolated and lonely. Many of us cannot be with our family or friends. We've lost our jobs. We don't know how we can make ends meet. And perhaps most difficult, we have no idea when this will end. Jesus said, I will be with you always to the end of time. Help us welcome the embrace and comfort of his presence. Lord, the psalmist reminds us that you are our protector, our shelter and shield. Help us to know that your trustworthy hand is upon us. Lord, the leaders of nations, state governors, town mayors, all persons in authority are overwhelmed. Grant them wisdom and compassion as they wrestle with such critical and crucial decisions. May a fresh spirit of collaboration and unity arise among them. Lord, protect those who are putting themselves in harm's way. Doctors and nurses and hospital staff, grocery store and pharmacy workers, those who deliver oil, collect our trash, patrol the seats, there are many more. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving for them and hold them in your protection. Lord, even thinking of it breaks our hearts. A million refugees in a single camp in Bangladesh, asylum seekers south of our southern border, living in such truly inhuman circumstances. The homeless, those for whom things are truly desperate, and they are so vulnerable. May they, amidst it all, know that you love them. And finally, we pray for each other in our Trinity Church family. Faces come to mind. Spirits stir. A smile and a cheer may join on our faces. Lord, hold us each and all in your light and love. Now let's join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.